A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up with the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to your human masters with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not only when being watched as currying favor, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, willingly serving the Lord and not men, knowing that each will be requited from the Lord for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. Masters, act in the same way towards them and stop bullying, knowing that both they and you have a master in heaven and that with him there is no partiality. The word of the Lord. The Lord is faithful in all his words. Let all your works give you thanks, O Lord, and let your faithful ones bless you. Let them discourse of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might. Making known to men your might and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is a kingdom for all ages, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and holy in all his works. The Lord lifts up all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Dominus Fobiscum, Ergum Spiritus Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam, Gloria Ti Jesus passed through towns and villages, teaching as he went and making his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few people be saved? He answered them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will attempt to enter but will not be strong enough. After the master of the house has arisen and locked the door, then will you stand outside knocking and saying, Lord, open the door for us. He will say to you in reply, I do not know where you are from. And you will say, we ate and drank in your company and you taught in our streets. Then he will say to you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. And there will be wailing and grinding of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves cast out. And people will come from the east and the west, and from the north and the south, and will recline at table in the kingdom of God. For behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. Verbum do homini.
We have a powerful teaching today that this question of salvation, there's a narrow gate there involved that we need to pass through. And there's a striving. There's an effort that we have to make. God's mercy is free, offered to us in a superabundance. It's there for the taking. Grace is lavished upon us and the sacraments and the church. We have so many means of, powerful means of salvation. Sacraments, the word of God, the fellowship of believers, you know, our teachings on prayer, spirituality, all are there to help us. And yet there is still this human effort required, this cooperation with grace, that is just not casual knowledge of or being with or culturally religious, you know, that satisfies. There's an aspect of striving, of putting our heart into it. And the passage ends with some are last will be first and the first, some first will be last. <clears throat> that <clears throat> there might be, you know, appearances here might be deceiving. Those who appear to be first might actually be the last, you know, in the kingdom of God. So it's a solemn warning, but I think something we know deep down. We know that everything in life the good things in life, the great things in life take some effort, take commitment, and take perseverance. Teresa of Avila would say this is the most important of virtues, is persevering in the faith, in this striving, giving it all you got. Get after it, right? <laughs> There's that aspect of the faith that uh, sometimes gets lost, and I think, in our theology, but we know in our hearts. I think in our culture today in the United States and even around the world, as I think it's particularly felt in the US, we feel like there is something wrong. There's a great kind of struggle taking place, a spiritual battle, a battle of values and things. And, and it feels like it's moving so rapidly. Like it's, it's not in, it's out of control. <clears throat> our technology is just every year advancing. It seems like on a logarithmic curve even that it's just moving so fast. And we need to be rooted in God. That is a source of our goodness, of our stability, of our peace. We need to be rooted in a natural moral order, in objective truth. And maybe that's the shakiest thing, the relativism that we see today, that there is no objective moral order, that we can just make that up. If it's good for you, then it's good. But today in Ephesians, we're called back to some sanity here, some basic sanity. And interesting, you know, this discussion of the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that, will make, that it may go well with you that you may have a long life on earth. We see that in, the, in Exodus, when the commandment is given, you know, to possess the land, to have this long work, this long life, you know, to have blessings, you know, in the promised land that they are given. Honor your father and mother. This is the fourth commandment. The first three commandments pertain to God himself, that we're not to have no false idols, to have reverence for his name, to keep holy the Sabbath, and this one is commanding a respect of children toward their parents. It's called for by the virtues of love and justice. The parents, with the help of God, gave us life. They made sacrifices for us. They raised us. They were there for us, hopefully. And we owe a debt to them. This honoring comes after these commandments towards God himself. And it suggests that this, this honoring of our parents has something to do with the sacred, the divine, that the basis of, it's at the basis of every kind of human respect towards all forms of authority, teachers, employers, government leaders. You know, God is at the root of that. And 
we did not simply put, we did not give ourselves life. We've received it. And this is the foundation of a humane society, this respect for life and those who have given it to us, those who have guided us in this life, the foundation of a humane society. And that's something I think we feel, the coarsening of our society, the harshness of it at times. So grown children especially are to give a material and moral support to their parents, rooted in gratitude and respect, to make sacrifices for their parents. And that God, you know, is rooted in this respect, that he is, he is the basis of objective truth and authority comes from him. That our social nature demands an authority. That naturally, we're, we have a social human nature, our, our human nature has a social aspect to it, so we naturally form a society. A society needs authority for governance to guide it to the common good. It's rooted in our human nature. And God is the ultimate source of this. So we speak of authority as rooted in God. And yet it has a human agency in modern democracy. We choose our leaders. There's a human responsibility in the choice we make. And the elevated leader, you know, has, of course, has to respect that authority and natural moral law as well. So legitimate governance is rooted in divine moral order, must recognize, respect, promote essential human and moral values. It's not just simply popular rule or might makes right or, or mob rule. You know, there's our collective conscience as a people can become deadened. So we have to come back to that authority of God of which all this is rooted in. And this, you know, in that authority that we exercise that God gives us and our leaders have must correspond to the dignity of the human person in accordance with right reason. We need some objective standard. It just can't come from ourselves because we're fallen human nature. We see things through a self-centered lens. What's good for me? What, what I want? So our leaders have this responsibility to be rooted in moral truth. And citizens have a duty to submit to just authority and just laws. We're called to pay taxes, to vote to defend the country. It's been so disturbing to me, you know, this election season, this election cycle we're in, is the brazen rhetoric we hear about abortion without apology, without hesitation, like it's some good even. It used to be somewhat more moderated, the pro-choice side, but now it's just brazen. And this, and this truth about the evil of abortion is accessible through reason. Yes, our faith teaches it, but a person of, a reasonable person can see that the child in the womb has its own growth, that a new human life has begun. The unborn child has its own DNA, its own blood type. So it should be respected, protected. I mean, to me, the simple argument that, okay, five minutes after birth, it's protected, but five minutes before it's not, nothing's changed there. That yes, that is a great responsibility for the woman, for the father, to protect that life. God entrusts us with that, and it demands sacrifices, and it's a, it can, be difficult as part of that striving, right, to do what's right. I was reading that there's 12 states where minors do not need permission from their parents to have an abortion. And I'm sure that many want to grow that number. I'm sorry, there's 12 states in abortion. There's five states uh, in terms of the transgender treatments that like hormone therapies or counseling a child can receive these without 
parental consent. I was listening to one, it's a different Christian network, but the, the person on the air there, the radio, was, was saying that they don't even let their children choose the breakfast cereal they want to have in the morning, let alone their gender. That parents are to guide to help the children, that if a child experiences this dysphoria, this disconnect with their body and charity and love to help them, you know, to come to accept that, to live in harmony with that reality. That's the loving thing to do. For the state to come in and overreach and take this authority from the parents is, it just seems like a terrible abuse that we see today and is growing. I hear that from families, that they feel like they're losing power and control over their children. That the state is usurping that. So these are violations of the natural moral order, the natural moral law, a violation of this authority given to the parents and the respect that children are to have towards their parents. Authority needs to support the proper autonomy of the family. Parents naturally want what's best for their children. Even if it's mistaken at times, they want what's best. Government needs to respect that. It must be, you know, it must be protected. I mean, your, the government does have to step in, in in more extreme cases when the parents can't do what they should be doing or something, but it needs to always have this respect for right reason, you know, for what is best for the children according to a natural moral law. That's not changing every, you know, with every kind of movement in our society and culture. You know, in this election, I think it's so critical to look at the worldview of the candidates. What, what kind of worldview do they have? What are they embracing? Because that's what they're going to foist upon a populace. 